Guys and girls, welcome back to another episode of RNT Fitness Radio. And wow, what an episode today's one was. So this week, Akash and I had a guy called Craig Ballantyne on the line, who is actually our business coach's mentor. And he hasn't received uh, the nickname The Godfather for no reason. He has a ton of experience across both the fitness industry and the business industry. Akash and I followed him back in the day with his turbulence training. He now runs a very, very, very high-end business uh, mastermind. He, I guess you could also call him uh, a lifestyle coach and that he runs what's known as the Perfect Life Workshops, which is all about engineering your perfect day to give you the life that you want. So it's how to optimize time management, how to really nail down and get clarity on you know, what's important to you and so on. And just so that you guys know this, Akash and I don't just get any guests on here just to fill a slot each week on this podcast. We genuinely only reach out to people that we feel are going to provide you, the listener, with value, are going to provide Akash and I with some form of personal fulfillment, and people that we look up to, we trust, and that we know have integrity. And Craig ticks all of those boxes, so much so that within two hours of finishing this podcast, I'd actually reached out to Craig, put my hand in my pocket, and invested into booking myself onto his perfect life uh, workshop in London this August. So I got off the call, I spoke to Akash and I said to him, look, you know that you have your routine nailed down. You're up at 5.30 every day, you're very, very time efficient. I'm the complete opposite. I mean, I'm recording this intro at 17 minutes past 10 at night. Um, So I really want to work on better time management and kind of working out where my magic time is and, and doing all I can to protect that, which you'll, you'll hear a little bit of that um, within the podcast. So yeah, so I spoke to Craig, I booked on uh, into August. I'm now receiving emails from Craig straight away, um, like accountability emails. So I'm, I'm super excited for the next 12 months. I'm excited for the workshop in August. If any of you have any questions about it um, as to whether you feel there would be a good investment for you, feel free to DM me and I can just give you kind of my general thoughts. In terms of Uh, What we cover in this podcast, aside from mentioning sort of how to structure your day, Craig also gives some really, really, really invaluable advice on um, dealing with anxiety, the sort of the symptoms that he had uh, initially and sort of mechanisms that he's come up with to overcome it. We also talk about uh, introverts and how it's important not to kind of place yourself within that box And Craig also comes up with some ways to network as an introvert and actually to play to your strengths. So there's a lot that we cover in this episode that's really going to help anybody, whether it's just trying to, you know, uh, organize your time management better so you can get your meal prep in, you can get your steps in, your cardio, your training around your busy lifestyle, your family life, and so on. It's great for those suffering from anxiety or perhaps introverted. We discussed a little bit of training and sort of where, where Craig structures his training or what sort of training he's doing. So I think this is an all-round great podcast. I'm going to stop rambling at this point, and I'm going to let you guys enjoy it. So um, so Craig, let's kick this off then by talking about the evolution of Craig Ballantyne. And by that, I mean, you. from what I know, you started as a PT, then transitioned into uh, online fitness training. And then now, obviously, you're a business coach, and you help people with their businesses. So talk us through like each step of it. How, and why you've moved on to the next phase. Yeah, so when I started out, you know, when I was in uh, school, before I even got to college, I wanted to be a strength and conditioning coach in the National Hockey League of all things. So imagine, you know, I actually even, I love uh, English Premier League soccer, so I actually thought, like, you know, I want to be a strength coach in some sport. Hockey was first, soccer was second. So that was my, my whole goal when I went to college in uh, 2000, but when I was 25 years old, finish up, finishing up my master's degree in exercise physiology, I had already started an online email newsletter, and I sent one of them to the fitness editor of Men's Health Magazine, and the next day, he replies back and goes, okay, we'll put this in the, in the magazine. So everybody always asks me, like, hey, how do I get started with the magazines? I'm like the worst person to ask because that doesn't happen to anybody. It's like, no. you know, some model getting spotted in the food court of the mall, you know, it's like it's one in a million shots. So I got lucky. And then I realized I loved doing that. And I also realized that magazine editors, much like television producers, are overworked and underpaid. And so if you ever get a chance to work with any of these people, whether they're on, you know, online websites or magazines or television stations in any industry, you know, it doesn't have to just be fitness, but if some real estate agent is listening and or financial person is listening, you know what, if you get a chance, 
make sure you get back to them and help them meet their deadlines because they're on these crazy deadlines. And that's the thing that I did that allowed me to get more work with Men's Health Magazine. So now it's going on 18 years of me writing for them and many, many other magazines. And it was all because I took that chance Mm -hmm. back when I was a younger person. That led to me selling programs online while, as you mentioned, being a personal trainer, PT. And I always wanted to do the online stuff. So I worked really hard during the day with the PT stuff, but every single spare moment I had, whether I was standing on the subway in Toronto, like I would literally stand on the subway with a Blackberry and write articles like this yeah. and uh, like, you know, packed in there like sardines, like, you know, people on the tube in London. Although I will say the one thing I hate about the tube in London is that it's round and you can't stand up against the walls. Like you yeah, you go deep down a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. They have, then that, I guess it wouldn't be called the tube then, you know? So, you know, in, in Canada, in Toronto, we have these big rectangle things, lots more space. So I would write articles in there and then I'd write them in between clients. And that allowed me to continue to grow my online business. And from there, finally in 2005, I hired my first business coach and really went on to finally be able to step away full time from the training and do the online thing. So that's the fitness side of things. Is there anything you want to ask me before I keep on rambling on here? No, it's it's quite interesting actually. No, keep going. Yeah. So the funny thing was at the same time, well, funny now, not funny then, but funny thing was in 2006 when I hired my first business coach, I had severe anxiety attacks at the same time. So I was going from being a personal trainer to full-time online. And it gave me the paradox of freedom is what I call it, where I had all the time in the world to work and all the time in the world to go out and go to the pubs and chase girls and all this stuff in the big city of Toronto. It's very much like New York City and London when you can go out any night of the week, you can find somebody to go. I ended up with these anxiety attacks because I worked too much and and, uh, drank too much and used too much caffeine the next day to kind of get back on track. And I actually went to the emergency room twice And because of that, that led me to start structuring my day, structuring my day better, to have better wake-up times, better end-of-day times, boundaries within my work, become more productive, crank the workout, but then have more time for recovery, self-care, they call it these days, that sort of thing. And then that led me coaching other entrepreneurs. I started coaching entrepreneurs in productivity and time management, but also in how to build a business. And so I had my first seminar in 2007, had 55 uh, fitness experts, many very famous names that you would hear today, including Vince Del Monte, uh, yes. our friend. He was at that one in 2007. Um, he made some very bold claims at that one, and sure enough, he delivered on it because he's a, he's a very great student of mine. And then I started coaching people on the phone about structuring their days. Eventually, I bought another business called Early to Rise, which allowed me to go and help people build their wealth and improve their health and improve their personal relationships. And then I, I finally published my first Uh, non-fitness book. I have several fitness books, but I published my first non-fitness book called The Perfect Day Formula in 2015. And that one has gone on to sell about 25,000 copies. And we have these Perfect Day Formula kits, which are, you know, gratitude journal and scripting pads Mm -hmm. and all these things to help you get more done. Those have, you know, probably sold about 5,000 of those. And now I consult with CEOs of very large companies I coach entrepreneurs who are just starting, those who are going from 1 million to 20 million. And I just love coaching high performers, you know, some athletes, some Hollywood actors, but not in terms of training, but in terms of clarity, focus, getting more done and achieving the uh, the goals and dreams that they have. So that's the Craig Valentine story. Awesome. That is uh, quite an impressive one, isn't it? Yeah. It's a real evolution there, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And I went, you know, for everybody listening, I mean, I, you know, if you had this interview with me three years ago, it would be like this and it would be really boring and monotonous, but I learned how to bring the energy through all these podcasts that I've done. I've been interviewed 200 times. I've had probably done over 150 YouTube videos. I've some that have been watched two and a half million times. And I have some that have been watched 2 million times that are the really boring and monotonous robot voice. So I have, uh, you know, I've been across the spectrum there and Everything is a learnable skill. That's one of the big things that I want to teach everybody, whether you're learning how to squat, whether you're learning how to eat properly, whether you're learning how to become a financial advisor, whether you're learning how to become a great author, a great speaker, everything is a learnable skill. And I've even gone from having severe introverted tendencies to being you know, relatively normal, I guess you would say, and, and extroversion and, and outgoing and all that sort of stuff and being able to be a great listener. So I've improved a lot of areas. And so whenever somebody says, 
they're this or they're that. I say, don't put yourself in that box, okay? Don't say that you're an introvert because now you're in the introvert box and you get to use all the excuses of the introvert from the introvert box and it stops you from growing as a person and making that evolution. So I am really, really big on believing that you can improve every single day through so many means like self-reflection and coaching and all these good things that you guys are well aware of and promote to your folks. Let's, um, let's just talk about the introverted side of things quickly. And yeah. one of the, uh, the parts that you touched on um, in San Diego that I think would be cool for our listeners listening to this is um, you touched on like networking as an introvert. Yeah. Can so you give when, like, a bit of advice if somebody is listening to this and they, they're thinking, as you said, don't put yourself into a box, but naturally you're going to have some people listen to this thinking, I'm an introvert. Uh, you know, I struggled you know, to network. I, how would you go about Improved. Well, that's what I did when I first started off when I believed I was in that introverted box. And so there's a couple of points. The first thing is that you can use the, the pros of being an introvert, which is where you do, you know, you analyze things more, you plan and prepare more than the extrovert, you come about it more methodical, and you can use that to your benefit. So several of the things that I did were, first of all, I, I really leveraged my critical credibility. Now, an extrovert in your mind, you think, would go to a party and just walk up to somebody and start talking to them. Now, an introvert kind of is like, how do I go into this conversation? What do I say? If you can think of a way that you can bring credibility, like maybe, you know, for me, it was easy because I was writing for Men's Health Magazine. But even if you have an introduction from somebody, you can say, hey, when you introduce me to that over there, I'd like to talk to them, I'd like to get to know them. Um, can you introduce me this way? Well, now you have some critical credibility. You've been referred by somebody else and you've been set up and it makes it easier. That's what, as an introvert, I was always looking for something to get the ball rolling. I could go, you know, I could be at stage five in a conversation with somebody, but getting stages one through three were a nightmare for me. It was like, how do I get there? You know, how do I, how do I get to a point where everybody's at ease, where most extroverts, because of the energy they, they feed off of, you know, they don't mind if you, you stay at point zero for a while rambling about small talk until you find something. But the introvert's like, this conversation is going to be so weird unless we connect on something. So, yeah. so you know, that was, that was one of the things. But I also did a lot of networking through email, which, again, plays to the introvert's strengths, where you could come to somebody and you could properly articulate what you wanted to say, even though it's hard to come out of your mouth, it's really easy to write for most introverts. And, and so that was another thing that I did, especially back when email was just getting started and it was easy to get a hold of somebody. Now what I would recommend you do is use Instagram direct messaging or you know, if, you're, if you're making a cold introduction of yourself. I'd also recommend getting introductions via text from somebody or email from somebody, very much like I used in that party example. So by doing that, by coming in with some credibility, with some position of strength, with some introduction where you can get the ball rolling and kind of naturally get in the conversation, it's easy for you to do that. Now, at the same time, I also want to challenge somebody so that you use or you get outside of your comfort zone. So Instagram direct message video is a really, really great place for an introvert to start overcoming their introverted tendencies. You can make those little 15-second clips. You have to get to the point quickly. You can redo it a couple times if you don't like what you say. And then that's a great way for you to start to get comfortable talking because, you know, you're just talking to your phone, so it's really, really great. No one, you can't feel any judgment from other people. So that's what I recommend there. Um, and then, geez, what else was there? I know there was something else that was really important. Oh, yeah, I want to go back to uh, this guy. Keith Ferrazzi has a great book called Never Eat Alone. Mm. There's two things in that book that really stuck out with me. One was timing your connections with people. So if you're emailing somebody or sending them a direct message on Instagram, if you time it so it's right before they start their day or right at the end of their day, he believes you have a greater chance of getting connected with people. And I've used that with some success before in the past with email, now with the Instagram direct messaging. And then finally, the other thing that he says in that book is, ease their pain and help their kids. If you want to connect with somebody, if you want to make an impression on somebody, if you can ease any pain in their life, and it doesn't matter if somebody's a, you know, if you meet Richard Branson and he's got back pain and you can help him with his back pain, you don't have to be a billionaire to make a connection with Richard Branson. You've just eased his pain. So you just want to find a way that you can add value to somebody's life. Now, I don't recommend like rooting through somebody's trash in order to find a way to, uh, you know, ease their pain, like, you know, reading 
you know, seeing like, oh, this guy eats a lot of pizza, so I should, uh, you know, help him with his diet. You know, that's not a great, great way to do it. But if you can have some type of, oh, this is public knowledge. I know how I can help them. Get an introduction, put you in a position of strength. Now you can ease their pain. Or same with helping their kids. You know, you know somebody who's, who, uh, you know, like maybe people have kids who are listening to this. There's somebody who's influential, who, whose kids go to the same school as your kids. You want to get connected to that person. You know what? If you can help their kids out, maybe give them a book, share a book with them, that would be helpful. So, you know, one example that Bedros Koulian, one of my really good friends did, he bought a whole bunch of copies of a children's book by a famous person and gave the, the copy of the children's book to all of the kids at Bedros' kids' school. Now, he put that on Instagram. The next thing you know, he's really good friends with a person who had a massive following on Instagram, and it's paid into great benefits for Bedros. So just thinking about that, that's the introverted approach to networking. And I know it went on for a long time, but I know there's something in there that everybody can use. Oh, d definitely. Let's do uh, one more sort of psychology side of things, and then let's move on to like the perfect day. And Yeah. So you also touched on anxiety. So we've covered, uh, you know, introverts and then also anxiety that nowadays, you know, with being connected all the time, I think uh, a, lot, a lot of people can probably empathize with. So can you talk us through sort of how the anxiety started with you and then what, what sort of solutions you came up with to help get over it? Yeah, it started with sure, get over it, but, but deal with it, you know, because it's probably going to be an underlying thing, I'd imagine. Yeah, it started with seven Red Bulls in one night, which is not a good idea. So uh, just if anybody out there is drinking seven Red Bulls in a night, don't do it. So that, that was like the tipping point for me. But it was, it was being exhausted. It was overworking. It was overplaying. Uh, but also, I was really wound up, uh, straight-laced, tight, like tight-laced up. Um, imagine like a, a soccer ball or if any American listeners, like an actual football, like just blown up and blown up and you stop and you don't stop putting air in it. That was me, right? Because I didn't talk things out. As an introvert, I held everything in. Um, and also as a type A person, I was really wound up and my wheels were always spinning in my head. So that ball was just getting inflated, 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 and all of a sudden, boom, you add seven Red Bulls to it in a burst. And that's what happened to me. And I ended up feeling like I was having a heart attack. And here I am, 29 years old, right? A personal trainer, a guy who writes for Men's Health Magazine. Six days a week, I'm living the, the right life. And then one day of the week, I'm in the pub from 4 p.m. till, and then in the club till 4 a.m. And, you know, that's bad news. And it, out, and it all caught up with me. And so it was eventually what I realized is you have to get out of your own head. You have to get out of your own home physically, get in sunshine, get fresh air. And you have to get out of your own head where you have to talk things out and you have to do stuff like meditation, yoga, qigong, tai chi, breath work, all of this stuff to use the parasympathetic nervous system to calm down the parasympathetic nervous system. So you have two nervous system, you know, two, two um, parts of your nervous system. You have your sympathetic nervous system and that's your fight or flight. That's when you're like fired up. You're going in and do a training session. Adam's got you like this workout is going to crush it. You've had a pre-workout. Your adrenaline is, is, you know, going through your veins, um, which is a hormone, you know, the epinephrine running through your veins and you're fired up. And that is sympathetic nervous system is pumping that out. Now, the thing is, if you are like that all the time, like say you're a financial guy in the city of London and you are like that all the time and you're out there smoking cigarettes and drinking vodka and Red Bulls every night and you're sleeping four hours, you are going to get crushed by this eventually because your sympathetic nervous system is just going crazy. So what you have to do is you have to work on your parasympathetic nervous system. Deep breaths, big belly breaths. In through the nose, hold, and exhale slowly. And that activates the parasympathetic nervous system, calms you down. So you have to look at whatever uh, slow down method of choice is going to be good for you, and you have to do that. It could be walking meditation. It doesn't have to be sitting you know, cross-legged on the floor med meditation. It could be uh, one of the things that I'm really into right now are these guided meditations on YouTube. And I know there's apps out there for them. I don't use any apps, though. I like to keep my smartphone clean of apps. But I use guided meditation on YouTube. Oftentimes with a nice, uh, calming British accent uh, is, is always <laughs> elevates the guided meditation as well. Of course. And, yeah, yeah. Any recommendations there? What's that? Any recommendations? Man, I just, I just go on and type in 10-minute guided meditation on YouTube. Okay. And, you know, there's uh, 
I forget. There's, I just look like, it, oh, it's got a million views. It must be good. Okay. So I'll just, uh, and there's a bunch on there and they have them for like gratitude or 10 minute um, anti-anxiety, you know, 10 minutes to start the day, 10 minutes to end the day. I did one last night to end the day. I usually do it in the morning, but I did it to, to end the day. And so all of these things, but what I did is, because I literally had what felt like a six-week heart attack back in 2006. I had tingling from the top of my head down to the end of my fingertips, tight chest, elevated heart rate. I couldn't breathe. And this went on literally. And I don't mean like literally the way like young people use the word literally about everything. I mean, this literally went on for six weeks straight, 24 hours a day. I could sleep from about Gary. 11. What's that? Gary. Yeah, I totally. Must freaked, yeah, I must have freaked you out. Yeah, yeah. I mean, so like I could sleep from 11 p.m. till 3 a.m. And then I'd wake up with the anxiety. It would wake me up. And I'd go and wander the streets of Toronto because I needed to get out of my little tiny apartment that I had at the time. And so, you know, I'd, people would see me and wonder what the heck was wrong with me wandering around the streets. But that calmed me down a little bit. And then every single day I, I was going to this stuff called Qigong, which is like standing meditation. I hated it, but I did it and it helped. I was going to yoga, which was okay because the yoga instructor was cute. So I, I would go back to that and that was okay and it helped. And I learned how to breathe and I tried meditation and I failed at it, but I, I learned how to breathe a little bit better. One of the things that most people don't do properly is breathe properly. And so what they're doing is they're, they're hunched over, right? And if you're hunched over and you are kind of like compressing your chest, then you're doing these short, shallow breaths. And that leads to like kind of a, a hyperventilation. It's like, which is good if you want to like get ready for a, a heavy lift or you're train, you know, you're getting ready to go into a game or something. You want to get fired up, but during the daytime, if you're doing that all day long, you're blowing off more carbon dioxide, and that signals in the blood to release more adrenaline. So it's like this vicious cycle. And so I was doing that, maybe because I was wound up, maybe because of the caffeine, maybe because of the poor posture I had, and I had to switch to that. I had to sit upright. I had to do those slow belly breaths activate the parasympathetic nervous system. So the, over those six weeks, I tried everything. I turned over every rock, but eventually at the end, near the end of that six weeks, I went to the emergency room for the second time and they did some chest x-rays on me. They gave me a heart rate monitor. They said, bring it back in 24 hours and then we'll call you the next day if there's anything wrong. And when they didn't call me, that was a huge, huge game changer. I was like, okay, there's nothing physically wrong with me. So it's all up here. And knowing that, I felt a whole lot better. And then I bought a book by an Irishman named Barry McDonough. The book was called Panic Away. And I got to the second chapter and the first five words in the second chapter say, there's nothing wrong with you. And as soon as I read them, it was like the weight of the world lifted off my shoulders. I didn't even read any of the rest of the book or any of the bonuses that came along with it, but it changed, it changed me. And I've been able to fight off for about the next year, every couple of months, anxiety would kind of creep in on me. And I had to like really slow down the breathing. I had to, you know, stop. It'd be, it'd be weird. Like I'd go to my chiropractor and we'd be talking about some lawsuit where a chiropractor like hurt a patient and I would leave and I'd be like, oh my goodness, like my neck feels weird. Like, you know, maybe, maybe I'm going to be paralyzed more. Like it'd be really weird stuff like that. And the next thing you know, for three days, I'd be on the verge of an anxiety attack, but I fought it off with all that breathing that I knew about. And, you know, just making sure that I didn't do anything stupid that weekend. And so eventually after about a year, I never had to deal with those things anymore. And today I don't drink um, more than one drink at a time now, but I can drink a fair, like more caffeine than I, than I used to and have no problem with anxiety. Whereas back in the day, if I had too much caffeine, I would be anxious. So you can, you can overcome it. Again, it's a learnable skill. It's it's hard because when you're going through that, it's tough to slow down and do the breathing. It's like when you're busy and you know you should meditate, you, you can't slow down to do it, but that's when you need the meditation the most. So that's, that's my story. No, that, that's perfect. As I said, now, you know, anxiety and stuff is on the rise. It's quite common. So the tip for the introvert and the anxiety is perfect. <laughs> yeah. I think one of the things, one of the, uh, the reasons that it didn't cause anxiety for me, but it, because I didn't even have a Facebook account in 2006, but uh, you know, I think it was just coming around. But now with the comparison syndrome, I think it elevates the anxiety and people are, are scattered and unfocused. And so you know, I coach a lot of people now who come to me as entrepreneurs and they're anxious because, you know, should I be doing this or this or this? And you're like, we're all over the place. 
And one thing about the social media is that you have to understand that out in California right now, some of America's and some of the world's smartest minds, like hundreds, thousands of the world's smartest minds are working right now to make you addicted to your phone. That's their job. Just like 20, 30 years ago, the food scientists in America, their job was to make you addicted to uh, crisps and chips and all the, the stuff that has caused so many problems. And now smartest minds are focused on addicting you to the phone and causing you anxiety and causing you to be all messed up. So realize it's not your fault because the world is conspiring against you. And now we need to come up with strategies to overcome that. And uh, what strategies do you have for people who are addicted to their phones, who's, which is nearly everyone? Uh, <laughs> yeah. So basically, it's, I, I, I use the analogy of like building a fence around yourself. So imagine you like in a big grass field and all the enemies are outside of you and you want to build this big wall that stops them from getting in there. And that's through habits and that's through automatic actions. Uh, it's not so much through discipline and willpower because those things are depletable resources, as many people know. But if you can build rituals and routines where your nervous system is like automatically doing things, then you can overcome this. And so I'll just give you a little story about how powerful rituals and routines are. When I grew up, you know, as a teenager, as a, you know, as a child, every night I would go into my father's bedroom and he would have candy. He would have uh, potato chips or crisps. He'd have candy bars, chocolate bars. He'd have everything. It was like a convenience store in his room. And I would go in there, I'd watch TV with him, and we'd eat candy. Now, you know, that's 20 years of doing that. And then I went off to college. And then he, he passed away when I was about 30 years old, just uh, 32 years old. And I would go back to see my mother on the weekends and help her like sort out the affairs after he passed away, you know, the paperwork and stuff. And every single time I went up the stairs into my old bedroom, I went to his bedroom first to look for candy. And that went on for three to six months after. Automatically, I'd go up the stairs and I'd turn right because my nervous system was ingrained with an automatic action. So if right now you're struggling with your smartphone, it's because your nervous system is ingrained with an automatic action, much like, you know, you guys teach perfect technique in an exercise. Over time, over time, over time, you build up perfect technique where you don't have to think about it. And with our smartphones right now, as we've built up this, I wake up, I turn on smartphone, I start scrolling. And if that is your nervous system right now, then you have to work to overcome it. And so you do have to put in these systems in place. Like right now, I have four steps that I protect myself with, with my smartphone. So I keep my smartphone in another room while I'm working. I keep my smartphone in a drawer in the other room. I keep my smartphone turned off in the other room. And I keep my smartphone in airplane mode, turned off in a drawer in the other room. And there are days where I will get all the way to turning it into airplane mode. And then I'll slap my hand, put it back in the drawer and go back into the room and finish my work. So it's stuff like that. It's going to those extremes to protect yourself using stuff like selfcontrol.io, an app that stops you from using I said I sent in that last week, actually. It's a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. yeah really Selfcontrol.io, uh, freedom.io. You know, there's a whole bunch of these things that just stop you from using certain websites or even the internet for a certain amount of time. And listen, these are things that, you know what? We need these. We mm -hmm. need these extremes in order to overcome our nervous system's tendencies and eventually you get to the point where it's like oh now i don't check my phone i don't even think about my phone there are days where i'll go with i'll go like six hours ago oh i should probably go and check my phone for important calls because it's been gone away from me so much so oh. that is the key all right that's quite uh, liberating for you then right yeah totally totally and, and it really is a big change Perfect. Do you want to start talking about? Uh, no, I was going to say. Pillars? Yeah, I was going to. I was going to say. Um, do you want, one thing um, that I learned from your Perfect Day book was uh, the five pillars. And uh, what I did is I actually wrote an article called "The Five Pillars of Body Transformation," based off uh, based off the principles that you talked for for I think productivity and you know the way you set up your day and uh, you know general goal setting. So I think it'd be great if you talked about it from um, you know a goal setting point of view and. Um, you know, more from a life perspective. Yeah, one of the things that most people do is they set way too many goals. So they have, you know, and I used to do this too all the time back in my anxiety days. I'd set like 
two pages of goals, you know, every New Year's. And then, you know, I, I would accomplish some of them, but I'd be so upset that I didn't accomplish most of them that I'd be disappointed in myself. And that's a shotgun scattered approach to life. You need to be laser focused. And so one of my mentors taught me, hey, Craig, you're only going to set four goals for your every year, one for your um, wealth, one for your health, one for your social self, and one for your personal enrichment, which is like self-development. And so when you do that, you focus on the bullseye. And everything around it, everything around it will become better when you hit that main goal. So that's the first thing to do. And it's very much like when you're scheduling your day. A lot of people end up very frustrated at the end of their day because they had 10 things on their to-do list and they only got through three and they think the day was a failure. But it wasn't. They just overestimated what they could do. So you have to be very realistic. You have to be tight with your time, but you also have to be very realistic about what you're going to do. So that's what I want people to do is cut back, make fewer goals, but really big goals, things that are really going to move the needle in your life, move you towards your legacy, and really make changes in your family and your personal, uh, personal self. And that is where you should focus. And once you hit those, everything around it will get better. Perfect. And then for each goal, do you use those five pillars to kind of help you get towards them? Absolutely. So, so the five pillars of success that I talk about in my book – are, first of all, better planning and preparation than ever before. So very, very um, applicable to anybody using your programs or you guys creating a program for somebody. You need to have better planning and preparation than ever before. If you ran the London Marathon in four and a half hours a couple years ago and your goal is to run it in three and a half hours or three hours, you simply need better planning and preparation than ever before. Or whether you want to lose you know, a couple stone in a transformation contest, you just need better planning of your nutrition because that's what's holding you back. And, you know, making it like a half-hearted approach to your nutrition has not worked for you. So it needs to be better planning and preparation than ever before. That is the first pillar. The second pillar is professional accountability. This is where you have a true professional relationship with a coach or a mentor. Because a coach and a mentor is going to give you two things that no one else in the world can give you. First of all, they're going to give you expert advice and they're going to hold you accountable. They are not going to let you away with any excuses. So... You know, if you tell a friend, uh, you know, I kind of messed up on my diet today, they'll say, oh, don't worry about it, you know, get back to it next day. But your coach, your accountability, they'll come and say, okay, listen, it is okay that you messed up. We're going to, we're going to, you know, don't be too hard on yourself, but how can we make sure this does not happen again? And we sit there and we make a plan and listen, if this happens again, then, then I'll be very disappointed in you. And if you're, if you have the right accountability, accountability is someone you don't want to disappoint, that you deeply don't want to disappoint then you can really, really make a lot of changes because that's what's allowed me to make so many of the changes in my life is accountability to someone I didn't want to let down, whether it was a coach when I was playing soccer as a youngster or whether it was a professor in, in my university and college days or business partner today, I will go and I'll do the work when I'm tired because I don't want to let them down. Now, third pillar of success is positive social support. These are your cheerleaders in life. These are the people you know, on the sidelines as you play a game, they're saying, you can do it, you can do it. Now, that's not expert advice. And if you fail and you lose, they'll still put your arm around their, their arm around you at the end of the game and go have a pint with you. But they're not going to give you expert advice and they're not going to hold your feet to the fire with accountability. But you need them. You need them to pick you up when you're feeling down. The fourth pillar is a meaningful incentive, the big why. Why are you making this change? Why are you going to, to Adam for a transformation? You know, like, what is it that you want? It's not because you want to, fit in a, a tighter pair of jeans. It's not because you want to win some money in a transformation contest. You're doing it because you want to change for your kids. You want to be around in 10 years when they're graduating and going off to college or university. You want to be around when they get married. You, you know, your doctor said like, hey, in four years from now, if you don't make changes, you're probably going to be in the grave. And so that's a meaningful incentive to make you go and change. And then finally, the fifth pillar is a big deadline. So Test, the transformation contest, the 12 week program, an eight week program, six weeks until our, you know, the season starts or whatever it is that spurs us to action. It keeps us going through tough times. And finally, it makes us go even faster as we get closer to the finish line. So that's what you need to have in place. Better planning and preparation than ever before, professional accountability, positive social support, a meaningful incentive and a big deadline. And you can use this for anything. It's not just about physical training. You can use it to find the love of your life. You can use it to find the home of your dreams. You can use it to become a better speaker, better coach, anything you want. Write a book, whatever. You can use that. I love it. Perfect. Yeah. Perfect. Speaking of perfect, the word perfect, um, 
Akash got the five pillars from your book, The Perfect Day Formula. Yeah. Um, and you're also actually, you're going to be over in London in August, right? Yeah, middle of mm-hmm. August. Can you talk uh, the listeners here through The Perfect Day Workshop, who would be suitable for it, uh, what you cover, just the lowdown and how it came about? You, you've mentioned how you structured your day previously, but when did you segue into developing like this as a, a product? Yeah, when did yeah you absolutely. Like, it's, yeah, it's a great question. Much, sorry, Craig, you're pretty much full time on the perfect day now, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. almost. Um, doing some, uh, some other courses and stuff, but really most of my time, most of my energy goes into working with high performers, executives, entrepreneurs, et cetera, as I mentioned earlier at the start of this, helping them build their businesses, but also build their perfect life as well so that they don't have that anxiety. They have less stress and more success. And so everyone has like their own, you know, customized result from the day. Some people might be, hey, I really need you to help me build uh, the revenue in my business and, and we'll focus on that. Other people are like, you know, business is going good, but I need to be better manager for my team and I also need to be better at home and we'll figure out what, what is necessary for them. But essentially, each one of these workshops came out of the perfect day formula. So the, the book became this kit full of tools and material and then That also combined with the phone coaching that I was doing with entrepreneurs led me to say, hey, you know what? I need to be in the room with about five or six entrepreneurs for a full day. We need to go through this system where we start with your your values and your vision because your values and your vision drive every decision. And then we go down, we start planning out, okay, here's where you need to be in the year from now. Here's the plan for that personally and professionally. Here's your 90-day quarterly plan for your business and for your personal life. And here's a 30-day fast start guide for you to get super fast results, to accelerate, to get like a year's worth of results in the next 90 days, we need to have these 30-day plans in place. And then finally, we finish off with knowing where you want to get to, knowing where you, what you want to achieve, you know, building these marketing sales plans, coaching plans, whatever it is. Then we finish off with, okay, here's how your busiest day must look. You know, if like most people don't have the same day every day. You know, some, you know, Mondays and Tuesdays are often busier, Fridays slow down. So we build out like, here's how your Monday needs to look. Here's how it needs to be scripted out. I have something called magic time that I help everybody find within the most productive time of day. And they protect that for the number one priority. And they leave the day knowing, okay, here's how my days are going to look. Here's the 90 day plan I have for success. And I'm going to follow that. And then I coach them in follow up through email coaching to hold them accountable to it. I'm the professional accountability to make them take action on it. And so, you know, like I said, there's only five people in the room because it's, it's as close to one-on-one coaching as I can get while still impacting a lot of people and having that amazing mastermind feeling in the room where people are sharing uh, ideas with one another because oftentimes there'll be somebody, you know, who has like a a 10 year old kid in the room with somebody who has a five year old kid and that person with the 10 year old kid can give advice on how to run a business while raising great children. So there's lots of across the table advice too. And so we just bring in amazing people from all walks of life and at the end of the day, everyone leaves knowing exactly what they need to do. It's a customized blueprint. And it just I'm just so fired up by it because I give people the clarity and boundary they need to really have success in life. With, in regards to uh, magic time, how do you help uh, people find that? So I do something like kind of uh, called a time journal. So imagine using a diet journal, right? Like, you know, someone comes to you, they're overweight, and they've never really thought about what they eat before. But that is so important, right? And we need to know, we can't just go and give them a a nutrition program without knowing what they're eating right now. And so what I'll do is I will have them very much like a nutrition journal, write down everything that they're doing over the course of the day, but not only what they're doing uh, in half an hour increments, but how they feel. So if we notice at 11 o'clock in the morning, every single day at work, you're like, "I'm, I'm going on social media and I'm wasting time then what's the connection here that we can make? Well, is it because you're tired, you're hungry, you're lonely? You know, what is it? And then, okay, well, maybe it's just that I'm tired and hungry. All right, well, instead of you going on social media, let's have you go outside for a five or 10 minute walk, have a green tea and and a handful of almonds. And then that way you have 10 minutes of recovery and you come back and go back to work instead of spending 45 minutes scrolling through social media. So we do that time audit and it helps us overcome those those negatives, but at the same time, it also identifies, man, you know what, eight o'clock in the morning, if I could just have eight o'clock till 10 o'clock, I'm so fired up, I'm so in the zone, I'm so creative, I'm so energetic, I just need those two hours, or maybe it's two till four, or maybe it's seven till nine at night, or maybe like me, it's really early in the morning, like five until seven. And then once you've found those hours, 
those hours will actually, that's when you're able to get three times as much work done at any other time of the day. So as a writer, if I can write between five and six o'clock in the morning, I can write about a thousand to 1500 words. But if you tried to have me do that at two o'clock in the afternoon, it would take me three hours. I just, I'd be distracted. I just wouldn't be productive. I wouldn't know what to write about. I wouldn't be creative. So that's magic time. That's how you find it. And, and that's what it does for you. And then once you know it, you have to ruthlessly protect it and foster it, keep, you know, appointments and calls and all that stuff outside of that zone so that you are able to, to move ahead faster. Yeah. You've, you've worked yours out, haven't you? Yeah, I'm similar to you. I'm, I'm an early guy. Uh, my magic times tends to be between six and eight, mm-hmm. six and nine. I, those, those two, three hours in the morning, I can get so much work done. And then after that, I just kind of do the, you know, the emails and, Right, and these I, try, things. I try and schedule the calls in the afternoon, and then after about six o'clock, I'm not productive at all. I just end up. That's when all my willpower is gone, and I'm just, you know, I can't do anything. Um, yeah, you and I are very similar, and and I know that you're very very dialed in with everything, and it's it's just managing your energy flow. You know, knowing what's right for your circadian rhythm, but also based around the schedule that you must keep and that you want to keep, and so. You know, I, I've just worked with so many people that I can figure out like, here's a hack, here's a 30 minute window in your day, or here's a change that you can make in your schedule that will allow you to like all of a sudden have this time, whether you want to write a book or whether you want to become better at sales or speaking or whatever it is, you can find this and you can fine tune it so that you become that high performer in whatever you want to do. And Craig, for people who, are, who find the magic time at night or, you know, later in the day, how do you structure like the early parts of their day? Oh, that is a great question. He's so referring I, to me here, by the way. No, yeah. I'll, be, I'll be emailing at like 11 p.m., half 11 at night. and uh, Yeah, yeah. Well, one of my best friends, Joel Marion, who's very successful. I mean, he built a $100 million supplement company. He would use my formula, but he would totally use it in a different chronological schedule. So he actually ran his business from about 9 p.m. till 4 in the morning. And it's funny, like sometimes I would stay at his big house in Florida uh, to get out of the Canadian winters up here, and I'd go down there. And I would start the day, I would go into the, the big office he had at four in the morning and he'd be like, oh, I guess it's time for me to go to bed. And we'd like <laughs> say hi to each other because neither of us wanted to talk to each other at that time of the day. And then we'd see each other later on, but it'd be like two ships passing in the night there. Um, and so basically, it's the same thing. It's protecting your time because it's not really about the hour you get up. It's yeah. about what you do with the hours that you are up. And so, you know, he would get up, he would do, he would basically do, do the reverse. He would get up, focus on family first. He would do exercise in the afternoon. He'd be a, do a little bit of busy work in the afternoon. Then he'd have family dinner. You know, he'd give the kids a bath, and then he would go to work. Now, the thing is, most people don't have the discipline to do that because, you know, they, they, we all have great intentions. Like, oh, you know, when everybody goes to bed tonight, I'm going to go and write that book chapter. I'm going to write these emails. You know, Adam, if you can do it, great. But most people are like, oh, there's Netflix. There's that bottle of wine that needs to be finished. You know, there's this. There's, you know, the spouse wants me to go to bed with them. And the next thing you know, they're like, oh, you know what? I haven't gotten around to doing that thing. So I actually believe it takes more discipline to be a a night owl than it does to get up early, do the work, and then get on with your day. And the the thing is, is that the world's built to reward early people because unless you're an entrepreneur when you can set your own schedule, like if you have to have client calls from nine until five or meetings and all that stuff, then listen, you're not going to get it done at night because you want to socialize and relax. So you have to get it done in the morning. So that's why we're so focused on that. Yeah, it's, it's funny because um, I'd love to be able to, to dial it in in the mornings and get it over and done with, but I seem to just sort of wake up and I, I just struggle to, to get into that work mindset. So for me, what I found is I come up with like what I need to do and then I just tick off the e- – I kind of do it the opposite way of as to what you should do, I guess. I tick off the easy stuff throughout the day, my client check-ins, and then I just leave the stuff that I have to do and I know there's a deadline. Like before I go to bed, it has to be done. Yeah, I just yeah that, is, that is the power of the deadline that you have within your day. And it's really neat that you bring that up because if you can work it that way and, you know, it doesn't interfere with social life and all that stuff, then by all means go for it. But if you wanted to switch it up, if you wanted to fix that, you know what the key is? Mm-hmm. What's that? It's, it is preparation the night before. The more and more that I work with people, the more and more that I read – about high performing athletes is that it's not about the performance, you know, on stage or in the game. It's about all the work done, all the preparation done up for the performance. And so 
as I work with entrepreneurs, uh, very similar to you, there's a lot of people with the online coaching businesses here in North America. And what they used to do was they used to get up and do the client check-ins and then try and work on something later on during the day. Now, these are people that are keeping an early bird schedule. Now we had to switch it up. The client check-ins have to get done. So they'll get done before the deadline of the end of the workday, much like your other stuff will get done late at night because you have that deadline of going to bed. But they switched it around. So I wake, I do the preparation the night before. I plan out what I want to focus on, you know, doing a new video or new content or whatever it is that works on the business. Mm -hmm. And they do that first thing in the morning because they're very well prepared the night before. And so maybe if you had amazing highest level of preparation the night before, then you get up and it's easier for you to transition into that work. And then you use the power of the deadline to get the client check-ins done because you know they have to get done. And so that's the deadline that they use. So for me as a writer, I make sure that I outline what I'm going to write the night before and then the words flow out of me the next day. So it's all about preparing the night before in order to have a high performance morning. So those three steps would be prepare the night before, yep. in the morning, work on the business, and then throughout the day, before the deadline, work in the business. Yeah, exactly. And so with, um, with the preparation the night before, there's actually three steps. And the three steps go like this. First of all, you do a brain dump. And a brain dump is where you take out a piece of paper and you write down all the things that you have to do tomorrow morning. So it might be you're doing this at 5 o'clock you know, at the end of the workday. You might do it at 7 o'clock after dinner. Or you might do it at 9 o'clock, maybe an hour before you go to bed. And you just write down, oh, you know, I got to call all these people. I got to, you know, create these videos. I got to, you know, do the client check-ins. I got to run these errands and I want to, you know, catch up with this friend. Well, that's a lot of things to do. Okay, that's step one. Now it's all out on the paper. Next step is we organize it into a priority to-do list, trying to keep it to a minimum, a minimum of major tasks. So, okay, okay, I absolutely have to create this video. There's a deadline for it. That's my number one priority. Number two is I have to write the book chapter. And number three is I have to... Um, you know, contact this person. If I get those three things, three things done, that's an amazing day. Everything else, if I can get to it, good. Then, now that you have that to-do list done, and the to-do list must be done the night before. If you're doing your to-do list the morning of, you're already too late because it's sucking up that really valuable morning time. And now, the last thing that you do is, okay, if I have to write that book chapter, I have to film that video, how can I make it as easy as possible for me to get into that in the morning. Well, I can you know, do a couple bullet points here, I can script out the video, I can put the video equipment out on the table so it's right there and I don't have to worry about setup in the morning. Just like you know, when somebody who struggles to exercise comes to us and they say, I wanna exercise first thing in the morning, but you know, I wake up and my exercise clothes are in the other room and next thing you know, I just hit the snooze button and go back to bed. But if we put the exercise clothes beside the bed and the running shoes right beside the bed, they put the clothes on and your half, half begun is half done. So that's the way we need to think about our mornings. And we do those three things, brain dump, priority to-do list, and what I call process planning to make the path smoother. Now your morning becomes so much easier for it to be productive. Perfect. Oh, uh, interesting. Great. Do you eat breakfast or do you wait? Um, I'm usually up about three to four hours before I eat breakfast. And you just do, you write before that, right? Yeah. So I get up. Um, I get up at four o'clock in the morning and I go right to work. I know a lot of people go right to meditation or journaling or gratitude or whatever, but I, I grew up on a farm and when you're on a, when you're a farm boy, you get up and you go and you, you feed the animals first thing, you go right to work. So I have that ingrained in me. And then after that, I reward myself with like meditation or, you know, something like, like the um, guided meditation videos or just meditation on my own. Then I walk my dog. And by then, and do a little bit, I do my daily morning social media video, but I go in, post the video, and get off social media. And by then, it's about 7.30, 8 o'clock in the morning, and I, I will have uh, breakfast then. And what time do you train? Uh, I'm going to train right after this, so mm -hmm. basically about 11.30 in the morning, yep. which is right before lunch. And then at lunchtime, I'll, I'll, uh, after lunch, I'll start doing some email stuff. Same routine as me. Yeah. Yeah, you yeah, guys. I, made an exception like for you guys so I want. I want to be known. I made an exception for you guys because I rarely do a podcast in the morning. But uh, okay, you know, it, was a, it was a great honor to be on with the, the boys from from across the pond. So you guys are getting some morning time from me. Awesome! It's an honor to have you on. Mm -hmm. Let's um, let's finish on one question before we do like some rapid fire stuff. Yeah. 
So if you could go back to your mid to late 20s, so the, the age of Akash and I are at, what would you do differently? Oh, hire a coach. Absolutely. So I was cheap. I said, this, you know, I said that would be the number one. I said to Akash, I said, I bet it'll be to hire a coach. Oh, talk. absolutely. I didn't hire a coach till I was almost 30 years old. And as soon as I did, my results went through the roof. So, you know, this applies to training. This applies to business. This applies to everything. If you want to get better at something, why go and try and figure it out by reading a thousand books and going to a thousand courses when you can just go to somebody who's already done it and who's helped a hundred or a thousand other people do it, it shortcuts your results by years. And so that is the thing that I wish I would have set aside my ego, stop being a know-it-all, you know, stop being a stupid, um, cheap, I'm, I'm half Scottish and half German. So, you know, I'm, a, I'm <laughs> you know, I've got that working against me. And well, I got an Indian with me. So, uh, <laughs> <laughs> cheap and efficient, you know, so, so, uh, I, that was the mistake that I made. And as soon as I did it, results went through the roof. Awesome. So uh, for, for potential clients listening to this, uh, that was a, a nice little plug for us. So, <laughs> so yeah, take heed. Um, okay, rapid fire. If you were going through a really tough diet, say you've got holiday booked, uh, you want to get in shape, you go through a really tough diet, what would be your go-to cheat meal or free uh, meal? Pizza. pizza, for sure. Pizza, yeah? Are we Which talking is like, like a plain cheese pizza, and then I would have extra uh, tomato sauce for dipping. Sounds good. Favorite city that you've traveled to? Yeah, that's tough. Um, uh, this I would definitely is say country is, country is Italy. Uh, city. Oh, that is tough. I will say, I'll just say Rome. Rome. Okay, perfect. That was, that was a personal one for me because I'm looking at getting a little city break in. So, uh, oh, okay. And I haven't been to Rome, so that works perfectly. Um, and the last one, who should we get on our podcast next? Uh, Bedros Koulian, if you can, for sure. Bedros is the man. He's my business partner. He's, he's built a massive fitness franchise in America. So if you guys can get him, he'd be great. And he's got his book coming out in September, Man Up, which would be a, a good read for everybody. Oh, awesome. One of the uh, questions that we'd, we'd had on here actually was if we'd had time, which now this is just kind of opened up quickly, if you don't mind to just segue into it. And again, this is just a personal thing. How did uh, you and Bedros start working together? we started sending each other books in the mail. Uh, so he was, I was on his email list and I think he was on mine and we saw what each other was, were doing back in 2009. And then I think I sent him a book first and that's what I do. I send a lot of books out. I probably spend like 200 bucks on Amazon every week. So keeping them in business among other people. And I just send books out almost like thank you cards with a little note in it. And he sent one back and then I sent one to him and then I went and did one of his coaching programs and he and I, he said, you know, we should start an online mastermind group, much like the one that you attended with Vince. Uh, you know, I had one of my own before that, but we teamed up and we started one in 2009 and we've been running coaching groups since then. So getting close to 10 years now. Oh, wow. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. yeah. Great. Um, anything that you want to... No, that's been perfect. It's been really insightful. And I think, a lot, I think our listeners are going to gain a lot from this. Yeah, yeah. I, I, love, I love doing these things. So thanks so much, guys. No problem. Let's, uh, let's just finish up, Craig, with... Um, number one, obviously the, the most important thing is where can people find you? And then number two, we've already sort of briefly touched on the seminars that you've got in August, but can you just yeah. give some more details, dates, how they can book on, um, the fact that it's not just aimed at fitness guys, right? This is anyone that wants to improve their day, their life, their business. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we have, we have someone coming in who's the CEO of a company that has over 2000 employees. So we have CEOs, we have business consultants. Um, I have three days doing my workshops in London. Uh, the 15th and 17th are sold out, but the 16th, um, that one is actually going to be mostly fitness entrepreneurs. And so you can find out more about that at perfectlifeworkshop.com. And then if you want to get started with my book, you can either get that on Amazon, you can get the audio version on Amazon, on Audible or Amazon. That's me reading it. So it's really, really a short read and short listen, probably about 90 minutes. And or, you know you can read it on a short flight over to Rome uh, from uh, London town yeah. there, Perfect. and you can, you can also get it uh, for anybody who's listening in America at freeperfectdaybook.com. Just pay shipping and handling. And then my favorite social media where you can find me is Instagram at real Craig Valentine. Awesome. Perfect. Perfect. We'll uh, put that all in the show notes uh, for our listeners. Uh, yeah, have you got anything to add? No, thank you for affording us your time. Thank you for, for doing it earlier on in the day. We really appreciate that. 
and uh, hopefully I'll see you in August. Yeah, absolutely, my friend. It's going to be a game changer, and I'm going to do uh, going to do a networking dinner there too. So I got a lot of friends. I want to bring them together from all industries, and and that's that's one of the things I love to do is grow the network and then introduce interesting people and let the relationships flourish from there. Perfect. Awesome. Right. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks, guys. No problem. Thank you, Take Craig. care, Craig. Bye.